Okay, marriage prep 101, getting ready for the big day. This is lesson number three. What to look for in a man. What to look for in a man. Well, it's hard to imagine what the person we will marry will be like if we don't have a certain set of expectations. Now, a lot of you are already married, so for this, this will be a, a nostalgia <laughs> journey today. But those of you who are not, hopefully there'll be some good information. I mean, uh, dating services, uh, especially the online dating service, I mean, they have their clients fill out extensive personal questionnaires, which they rely on in their efforts to match up suitable couples. You know, the better the information they have on individuals, the better they're able to match people together based on information. Unfortunately, many people are not sure of what they're actually looking for in a mate, or their ideal mate is described using romantic ideals rather than what we believe should be biblical ideals. So with this in mind, um, in this class and the next class, we're going to describe what to look for in a mate. So we begin with the women and state from the outset that it is to everyone's advantage when a woman finds a good man to marry. When that happens, it affects a lot of different, a lot of different people. For example, for his own family, he will be the man, the mate, he will be the one who will establish spiritual and moral level for his own family and thus bring honor or shame to his or her family and their extended family. It's important to find the right man because he's going to set the tone. Now for his in-laws, he'll be the one who will be responsible for the support and the protection, the leadership of their daughter and their future granddaughter, uh, grandchildren rather. Choosing the right mate, especially choosing the right man, for his future wife, he'll be the father of her children and his quality of character will determine if both Mother's Day and Father's Day and every other day will be times of happiness and thanksgiving or those of regret. And for his Lord, he will either be a channel of blessing to his family or he'll be an obstacle to Christ's presence in the home. Finding the right man you know, affects all the things that I've just mentioned. So it's extremely important to find the right man to marry because there is so much that depends on it for so many people, including the Lord. Of course, you never find the right man if you don't know what you're looking for or if you listen to what the world and what it promotes as its ideal. There's a lot of noise out there. There's a lot of static out there. And there are a lot of static deliverers out there, 24 seven news cycle, I mean, YouTube, Facebook, it never ends. So before we review what to really look for in a man, let's list some of the more popular things that the world sees as desirable in today's 21st century ideal man. Well, first and foremost, looks. Come on, looks. By far, what's number one on the checklist is looks. People say this is not so, usually to not appear too superficial, but according to what people do, looks is number one. Now, I don't mean any particular look, you know, like a muscular look or a preppy look or a skater look or a rich look, East Coast look, Gap look, rocker look. I'm not talking about that. The point is that the number one thing we're told is that you have to have a look or you need to have someone who's got a look. Of course, this is nothing new. Men have cultivated whatever look they thought would be attractive to women and vice versa for centuries. The point I'm making here is that in the world, finding a man that has the right look is extremely important. The world also tells us to look for a man with potential. 
we measure personal value in this nation by how rich or how famous or how skilled a person is. Again, we like to deny this because it sounds so shallow, but a quick look at magazines and TV and what's online that reflect our values show that this is true. We will sit through award after award show that simply gratifies the swollen egos of celebrities because we're enthralled by fame. We have endless books with outlandish praise lavished on people who drive cars or draw pictures. I, I'm not saying that sports or art are not worthy of praise. All I'm saying is that we use movie stars and ball players as models for what human beings ought to be. We value a person simply because they're famous. For example, Monica Lewinsky. Has this happened, her life happened 30 years ago or something? And yet she's still, she's still famous. But what is she famous for? She's famous for being immoral with someone who was famous. <laughs> she wasn't famous, but she, you know, she had sex with the president and he was famous. And so, not this president, but you know, a former president. Since most of us lack the, you know, the beauty or the talent to become famous, we seek status through the amassing of wealth and things. What is desirable in all of this, of course, is a, is a man who has the potential to excel in one of these areas. We want to hope that the man we choose has at least a chance at being great or being rich or being famous or at least being successful. We love winners in this nation. And a man who has what it takes to be one of these, wow, this is the man to look for, a man with potential. I suppose in general terms, the world also asks us to look for what's called a postmodern man. Postmodern, you know, that's a fancy term that describes the attitudes and value system espoused by the ideal man of this age. The postmodern man is the absolute opposite of the old fashioned man. And he's light years ahead of the modern man. He's the post modern man. Now, if you don't understand who this man is, the postmodern man above all else is tolerant. He does not judge anyone's lifestyle or actions. He's secure, he likes himself and he's secure in his abilities. He's balanced, he doesn't allow anything to overcome his sense of self. He is in control. He's logical, he doesn't deal with questions that are not posed or answered by science and technology. He's unisexual, meaning the postmodern man cooperates with every effort to eliminate the differences between the sexes, whether it be social or biological, and most importantly, he's a-religious. The postmodern man is not against religion, he just doesn't see any role it can play in his life. It's okay for his wife if she wants it, but he has no use for faith. This cool, independent, flexible, worldly man, this, the world says, this is the guy you ought to be looking for. Well, I could go on to describe what the ideal man of this world and of this age is, but I think you get the overall picture. Let me now describe an ideal man, not just for this age, but an ideal man for every age. And someone I believe is desirable as a spouse. You see, technology and custom, these things change but people remain pretty much the same. That's, that's the fascination about the Bible. You read about characters that lived 3,000 years ago and they're thinking and doing exactly the same things. They're feeling the same things as we feel today. People, you know, they, don't, they don't change. Oh, there are new ideas about how to do things or how we ought to be as people, but these are replaced in every age by other new ideas, which are really not new, just old ideas repackaged in new words. A good example of this, 
Well, you know, the modern idea of protecting nature, you know, the environment and animals, even at the detriment of human being. Where does that come from? You know, let's put, put 10,000 people out of work you know, so we can protect a type of ant or something. Where, where does that idea come from? Well, it rests on the ancient Eastern religious idea that all life, both spiritual, human, animal, and natural, that all of it is part of one single unit. This is where the idea that animals and people are the same. They're equally valuable. We have to set up associations to protect fish, for example, and the rights of fish. <laughs> of course, we know this premise is false in the same way we know what to look for in a man. We know the unification idea that everything's part of a single unit. We know that that's not true. Why? Because the Bible reveals the truth to us. As far as all life being one is concerned, the Bible teaches, among other things, that God is separate from His creation. You know, in the beginning, God, over here, created the heavens and earth, over there. He's not part of His creation. He's separate from His creation. Spirit and physical are not just part of the same unit, they're separate things. Human beings are a combination of the natural with the spiritual and they're unique in this. That's why their value is greater than anything else that has been created. Now, human beings need nature to survive physically, but their spiritual essence is in the image of God and is controlled by God. This makes them intrinsically superior by design than the creatures in nature. So no, an elephant is not equal to a man. 10 million zillion elephants are not equal to a single woman. Why? Because humans are made in the image of God, in the image of the Almighty. Animals are created by God, but they don't have the image of God. They have what's called sentient life, but they don't have spiritual life. And human beings are responsible for management and the development of the natural world. And they'll be judged for this, but they don't have the right, nor do they have the power to destroy the world. This God is going to do at the end of the world, 1 Peter 3, 10 to 13. All this business, if this goes on, it's going to destroy the world. Well, it may harm the world, but human beings don't have the power nor do they have the authority to destroy the world. Only God has that, has that power. Now we can mess it up and dirty it up, but we can't destroy it. Now if the Bible can separate fact from fiction as far as creation and the composition of humanity and the end of the world are concerned, don't you think it can provide us with a guide of what to look for in a man? I think so. After all, the same God who gave us the Bible created man. Surely he can help us in the task of finding the right man to be a husband to a woman. Okay, so what to look for in a man. I, I could list dozens of characteristics and abilities, but let's say if we can boil it down to just four. Four things that we can see that like the, you know, the tip of an iceberg suggests, you know, Pretty solid base underneath, okay? What to look for in a man? Number one, honesty. I mean, that is the number one thing. A false witness will perish, but the man who listens to the truth will speak forever. Honesty is the bedrock of any relationship whether it be with a spouse, a family, a member, an employer, a friend, in society, even with God. You can't move ahead spiritually if you're not honest with God. And so a, a, a man who is honest has an open heart to hear the gospel if he's an unbeliever, for example. A Christian man who is honest is teachable 
and more able to grow in spiritual things. He's also more likely to repent when he's wrong. You know, one of the reasons that it's good not to marry too quickly is that it sometimes takes a while to see if a man is really honest. And the best way to determine this is to see if he tells the truth in little things. If he, does, if he doesn't tell the truth in small things, chances are he won't tell the truth in big things either. So look for a man who loves truth and who demands it from you as well. Number two, again, we could list 20, but boy, these four, <laughs> they've got to be there or nothing else works. Number two, kindness. What is desirable in a man is his kindness, and it is better to be a poor man than a liar, Proverbs 19:22. Kindness is the doing of good for others, the focusing on others' needs instead of our needs. I mean, nothing is more beautiful and admirable in a man than having a kind nature. Kindness lifts a man up from among other men who tend to be selfish and self-centered because men as a whole, they tend to be selfish and self-centered. Kindness identifies a man as a, a, a channel of God's blessings and God's character. Kindness is a, is a window into the inner working of a man's soul, his true nature. You know, women ought not to be fooled by looks or muscles or fancy clothes or a car. All of these things can hide or dress up a selfish sinner. But a man who is kind regardless of his appearance or wealth, will know how to make someone else happy and satisfied in every area of life. So make sure you look for a man who is kind in his speech and actions and attitude, not someone who gives compliments or gifts to win favor. That's not kindness, that's manipulation. You need to know the difference. The player you know, who uses kindness as a device is looking to receive something in return. But the kind man acts out of his nature. It's just his nature to be kind. And you usually can tell the difference because the kind man is that way with everybody. He's kind you know, uh, with the server at the restaurant or the bus boy or bus girl. He's kind with the driver that delivers you know, your prime package. He's, he's kind with you know, the boss at work, but he's also kind with children. He's just kind. The hypocrite is that way only when he wants something from you. You need to know the difference. Third thing. Look for the man who can forgive. Jesus said, blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy, Matthew 5, 7. You know, they say that there are only two sure things in life, death and taxes, right? Well, there's another negative thing that we're sure of in addition to death and taxes, and that is failure. <laughs> I told, our children, when they were young and we had you know, long talks, I would, I, I've, I've told them, uh, get ready for failure. I want you to succeed at anything you try, but be ready for failure. I also remember saying to them, you know what? Most people in the world are ordinary. Most people are ordinary. Oh yeah, there are a few outliers. We read about them. They're in the newspapers and you know, they're the elite athletes or they're the, you know, the geniuses that come up with new math theories. You know, of course, there are outliers out there you know, who are just, a guy can hit a 100 mile an hour fastball or something. You know what I mean? There's, there's just, there are people that are just like that. You know? But most of us are ordinary. Get used to that idea. Unfortunately, in the society that we live in today, 
Young people are told, everybody's an outlier. You can be famous. Everybody wants to be famous. Everybody wants to be an outlier. But not everybody is. Well, the point of all of this is that it's a sure thing that no matter how sincere or how hard we try, we're going to make mistakes. We're going to mess up. We're going to say and do things, terrible things that we regret. And when this happens, oh, how wonderful to have a man or a dad or a friend or whoever who's able to forgive us and encourage us. You know, a man who can forgive is one who probably has a pretty good view of himself and his own faults. So he's not too anxious you know, to accuse or to judge another, especially his spouse. A man with a forgiving spirit has probably needed forgiveness in his life, and here's the important thing, and has received it. You know, people who have trouble with forgiveness, you know, offering it, articulating it, maintaining it, a lot of times it's because they themselves have never really received forgiveness when they messed up from the people that were important to them. It's very hard to give something that you never got. You know, you know some, some people are not very affectionate with, their, with anyone. It's just not a thing in their character, not a thing in their psyche. And you could say all kinds of things to them, you know. But if you scratch the surface and if you go down a little bit, if you could just rewind the tape of their life, you know, the video of their life, you might see that they didn't receive a lot of affection. My mother used to talk about that a lot. She was the middle child, she was the middle child of 11 children, <laughs> imagine, 11 children. And her dad uh, died uh, when he was like 50 years old or something and left his, her mother with 11 children. Well, one passed away, 10 children. And he died in 1929. So for some of you who are younger, you might not realize the significance of, the, of that date, but 1929 was the year of the, of the stock crash, the Great Depression started. Imagine, you're a woman, you have 10 children, and your husband dies and leaves you alone with 10 children. And my mother was the middle one. And she'd say, she'd tell me, she said, I would wait for hours for my dad, fine, he was a, he was a policeman, he was a detective actually. I would wait for hours for him to come home. And he would you know, always start with, you know, he'd kiss the babies and, he, and the older ones would come rushing to him. You know. And she said, maybe I'd get a minute. I'd climb up on his lap and he'd hug me and then that was it. That's what I got, that's all I got. And then he'd try to spend a little bit of time with my mother, she said. Well, my mother was not a huggy, you, know, you guys, uh, she, you know, our children who knew her while she was still, she was a good sport, she was a big tipper. <laughs> she'd be at the hospital in the waiting room and she'd be tipping the orderlies to go get her coffee or something, you know, she was a, <laughs> a character. But she wasn't a hugger. She was, you know, she was not one of those people. And the idea was she couldn't give what she never got. There was no reservoir of that. So we fool ourselves when we look for the perfect mate and think we've hit the jackpot when we find a man who seems perfect. But people who looked or aspired to perfection are usually driven by fear and poor self-esteem. They hate themselves when they make mistakes and they're pretty demanding of others as well. Beware of the perfectionist. The perfectionist is hard on themselves. Why? They don't know how to forgive. So the ver very first person they don't know how to forgive is themselves. You think they're going to have an easier time forgiving you? So look for a man who's merciful to himself. And when the time comes, and it will, he'll be able to show mercy towards you and the ones that you love. And then maybe one other I can add. 
Look for a man who is pious. Now this word piety comes to us from French and Latin roots, which means devoted. In a secular sense, it means to give the proper respect and devotion due to parents or family or spouse or to a cause or to the government, whatever. In a Christian sense, it refers to one who is devoted to the things of God, to the people of God, to the service of God, to the worship of God, to the things of God, study, the Bible, the church. It was said of Jesus that God heard his prayers because of his piety, Hebrews 5 verse 7. Now the postmodern man is devoted only in the secular sense. So he's pious, but only in the secular sense. So he's devoted to himself, his look, his success. He's devoted to his interests, whatever those are. He's devoted to his future, you know, the stability of his family perhaps, his retirement. But look for a man who has a spiritual component to his piety who is devoted also to the people and the work and the things of God. Not only devoted to God, someone who knows how to be devoted to God can also know how to be devoted to his family. But if a person doesn't know how to be devoted to God, that same person will not know how to be devoted to his family. So look for a man who has spiritual piety, who is devoted, as I say, to spiritual things. You know, men are called by God to be the spiritual and moral leaders in their families. How will they lead if they're not even interested in the things of God? Can't lead if you, know, you have no interest. So a, a, a pious man is the complete man, a man who has true potential for happiness and a full life. I'm not saying don't look for a man who has potential, sure. Uh, of course, but also potential in spiritual things as well. His devotion to God inspires confidence as to his purity and faithfulness and direction in life. Lee's often, you know, when we talked way back when we first started out, she used to say to me, I would not have married you before you were a Christian. I loved you then, she said, but I saw so many things that were like danger signals, you know, so many things that said, oh, no, no, not this guy. But after you became a Christian, and after I saw what you were aiming at, then I could feel confident in going forward in a lifetime commitment because of what you were devoted to, as opposed to what you were devoted to before you became a Christian. And so a pious man is devoted to the type of things that lead one to heaven. If that's where you want to go, then follow him. And he'll lead you there. You know, sometimes when you're seeking a cause of action regarding the repair of your car, for example, or a health issue, you ask the mechanic or the doctor, you, know, you say to them, well, what would you do in my situation? You know, like a lot of you, our AC unit is old Betsy is calling it quits here uh, on a hundred degree day. And I asked the individual who was you know, repairing that, what kind of unit do you have at your house? <laughs> Not what kind of unit do you recommend? What kind of unit, because I know that he just built a house. We know who I'm talking about here. I just don't want to put him on, on film. We know he just built a house. You know, I said, so what, what, what unit did you put in at your house? And he said, I put in this type of unit. I said, is that what you're going to put in here? He said, yep. I said, okay, sure. We figure that if, <clears throat> if they do it for themselves, the advice they give is at least sincere. You could be wrong, but at least it's sincere. I say this because this is the advice that I gave to my two daughters when they were single, now of course married to fine Christian men. And I stand by the same advice to my five granddaughters. If I live long enough to give it, the eldest is 11. I don't know if I live long enough to give her advice when it comes time for her to think about things like this. 
But if I get the chance, I would tell them to look for a man who knows the truth and who can tell the truth even under pressure, even when it'll cost him something, he'll tell the truth. Look for a man who's good and kind naturally. It's just part of his nature or he's trying to cultivate that nature. Look for a man who's full of mercy and tenderness because you're going to need that. Yeah, sex is great, but sex doesn't make a marriage last 50 years. Mercy, tenderness, understanding, that helps a marriage last 50 years or more. And look for a man who wants to do what is right. Even better than that, a man who wants to do what God wants him to do. And I'll tell you something, less single people in the room here than perhaps maybe watching with time online, but I'll tell you something, these type of men, they're out there. They exist, they're in this church, they're at your work, they're at the school you go to, they're at the government job that you have, they're out there. The key is knowing what to look for, being able to kind of you know, go through the weeds, you know what I'm saying? To find the, the right kind of men. Some are tall, some are poor, some are of a different culture, some are smart, some love the outdoors, others are comfortable with cars or computers or tools or tractors or books. But regardless of the outward container, these sincere, good-hearted, merciful, spiritual men, they're out there. And I hope that all those who are searching will eventually find these good and godly men. Okay, that's our lesson for what to look for in a man. You know what's coming next week. Not allowed to hand in your absentee uh, papers now. So what to look for in a woman. And so we'll, we'll go that direction next time around. All right, that's it for today, thank you.